Behind me are some of science's superstars. They've all won Nobel Prizes, and I'm here to ask them and some younger scientists about the future of medicine. Some of it's pretty surprising. Every year on Lindau Island in Germany, large numbers of Nobel laureates and young scientists meet. A rare chance for nature to make some films about the big questions in medicine today. To try to get a picture of health. Our first film looks at the elusive virus which causes AIDS. Now, I've been hearing all about this patient from Berlin who had mm -hmm. a bone marrow transplant and cured his HIV. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more. He had cancer. And what actually happened is that the cells that they transferred to replace his bone marrow, they were from um, another person who had a certain specific genetic mutation. The mutation, called CCR5, prevents HIV from infecting cells. So they whacked out all of his immune cells and replaced them with the donor cells. And he stayed negative for HIV ever since. I wonder how you felt when you first realised that the HIV had disappeared in that patient? First of all, I must say I did not believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Will it be your lifetime's achievement if, if we can really find a cure or a vaccine? Oh, I mean, that uh, will be a relief for me. Uh, it's really a dream, you know. <laughs> uh, but the most things that I'm really uh, concerned about a re-emerging HIV epidemic, mm -hmm. that for me uh, will be a terrible failure. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, worried about that. Our second film, The Long Goodbye, faces the challenges of ageing. What is the life expectancy of the world population today? Is it 50, 60 or 70 years? Please answer A, B or C. About life expectancy, you answered, let me see. Uh-uh. This is the right answer. You see why you think that population will age because life will be longer, because you don't know how long they already are. The world has been immensely successful in removing early death, especially among children. The aging of the world population is driven by something else than longer life. But even scientists haven't understood this. What do you think the challenges are of having a globally aging population? Can we afford to treat some conditions that are extremely expensive to treat, that don't have enough benefits. You have to f bite the bullet. I mean, we have to be realistic about it, and that's the trouble, we aren't realistic about it. We're sentimental and we say everybody has a right to life and so on, which is true, but you can't afford to preserve every life. We don't have enough money. For our third film, we ask if the side effects of drugs are inevitable. I've been talking to lots of students about whether we might ever be yeah. able to design drugs that have no side effects. I don't think that drugs have side effects. Okay. I think drugs actually have effects. Side effect is our interpretation of what we didn't want to happen. A bit like weeds in the garden, they're exactly. just plants in unwanted places. Exactly, yes. Actually, drugs very largely are selective poisons. Well, if drugs are poisons, is there a way we can test the effect on our bodies before we take them? If we want to make embryonic-like sub cells from your material, we can do that. We simply take your skin cell, grow those embryonic-like cells, and then make them into all different types of tissue. And then what we can then do is come in and start testing drugs against all those different tissues. So one of the most exciting technologies right now is the fact that you can take different tissues that are made from these stem cells, and we can actually start to build different organs on a chip. So you're building a miniature lung and a miniature liver and looking at how medication for one is affecting the other. Right. That? And our last film asked difficult questions about the war on cancer. It's 25 years since you won your prize. And what progress have we made in cancer in that time? Well, we've made extraordinary progress. I mean, the landscape is unrecognizable uh, compared to where we were in 1976. We're just not there yet. Now at least we know the fundamental underpinning, and that is the malfunction of genes. We do now have a fundamental understanding. We know where to look 
What's it like to work with patients who are facing these cancers, be they on the treatable side or the less treatable? I find it very challenging. My motivation itself to become a physician um, was initially because we had um, cancer run within the family. Instead of grieving for years and, and investing all this energy into the sadness, I just decided that I want to tunnel all of this energy into research. Cancer does not only affect the patient. It's a disease that affects the entire family and friends around it. And it really is a disease with no boundaries. So it's uh, in a way clearly a complicated disease, but it's not unresolvable. I mean, if we really put a lot of effort into the story, then we have a chance to do something. But we can only prevent these diseases if we understand fully the type of way and mechanism by which the disease is emerging. We're here in Lindau with 37 Nobel Prize winning scientists, 600 young researchers, 12 of them sponsored by Mars, and people want to hear all about the science that Mars has been doing. You know, well, the great thing about coming to Lindau is that we get to spend time with science's rock stars. You're aware that you're in the presence of greatness. And the more that we can find ways of engaging some of the finest minds in the world to helping us solve some of these grand challenges, I mean, there's got to be some great stuff in there. One of the things we do is we like to have a lunch where we basically spend time with the young scientists that we've sponsored to come here and tell them a little bit about the kind of company that we are, the kind of work that we do and why we passionately believe that these great scientists should consider coming to a company like Mars for a lifetime career in fun science that will make the world a better place best part really is that you get to actually meet these young scientists who will look at you in the eye and say, this is the best week of my life. To sit with a Nobel laureate and have a conversation, that is a gift. So we have a science breakfast, which is the opportunity for us to host a discussion around a very meaningful area of research of healthy aging. So we have Liz Blackburn, who won a Nobel Prize in this field, and we put her together with a group of young scientists in a forum facilitated by ourselves. Let's think about the huge amount of years that human lives are, right? So I made a little scale bar for you on this high-tech thing here. This is a time scale. What's the li maximum lifespan of a, a worm that goes from here to here, right? Of a fruit fly from here to here. Now things get a bit better. Okay, let's go all the way out to a mouse. But, all right, <laughs> keep going, keep going. Okay, we've got up to kindergarten, we've got decades and decades of life. So the science breakfasts are always great fun, highly interactive, and a really good way to have meaningful debate in an area of public interest, but also interest to ourselves. We're in middle age here, so maybe somebody's getting some diabetes now. I mean, that's the thing, it's not just your lifespan, there's perhaps years of living with chronic disease. I think you get the point, yeah. right? I'm just constantly struck by how we have to be thinking in terms of enormous timescales that these things are. The world is going to be facing an aging population. We're all going to get older and there's going to be a lot more of us who are old. How do we deal with that? Helping young scientists realize that they can work with somebody and realize that these are problems that the world has to solve. And business and science can do it together. I think the private sector can play a real role because this sort of research that can be done by a company that isn't necessarily related to just the uh, quarterly bottom line is the kind of research that's complementary to what governments can fund. And I think Mars is a good example of that. So we got. 37 Nobel laureates here and just over 600 young scientists and if we can play our role in catalyzing some of the magic happening between those two groups of people then we go away very happy. <laughs> <laughs>